Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Yes, question. So, what to do, do if, if, if you don't have, have this uh, uh, hinge, hinge, internal uh, hinge, yeah. Uh, how to solve the problem if there is no internal hinge? Remember we did a suspended deck problem in the last class to demonstrate how by hand calculations you can solve the problem. In that the stiffening girder was given a, an internal hinge in the middle, right? Traditionally why was this done? To make it just rigid, statically determinant. That's how you have three hinged arches. And here also you have a three hinge suspension girder with a cable on top. You need it. First we are making the assumption that somehow because of the stiffness of the stiffening girder, the profile of that cable will remain parabolic. Right? Okay. It's a parabolic profile. And uh, here. And if this is a parabolic profile, and somehow due to the stiffness of the supporting uh, stiffening girder, you are able to sustain this profile for any loading, even concentrated loading on the deck, then it's a fair assumption that this loading transmitted from the deck to the cable is uniformly distributed along the horizontal span. That follows, isn't it? Because we know that the cable will always imitate the bending moment diagram of a equivalent simply supported beam. That we know for sure. So if you can make sure this is parabolic, then it's a fair assumption that this is more or less uniformly distributed. Got it? Now the question you are asking is, we crack this problem by <coughs> Assuming that the bending moment at the middle of the stiffening girder is zero because we deliberately gave an internal hinge there. Correct? His question is, supposing you don't give an internal hinge there, how will you solve the problem? So you are now with a statically indeterminate problem with a degree of indeterminacy, one. So you tell me how to solve it. Of course, we are going ahead because right now, we are still in the realm of just rigid statically uh, determined problems. And we'll, in the book, this is in part two. Part three, we go to finding displacements, deflections, rotations. And with that knowledge, we go to part four, where we analyze statically indeterminate structures. It's all coming. But you jumped ahead and you raised a question. You've already studied structural analysis. You tell me, any of you tell me, how to crack it? You need to choose a redundant. What is a good redundant to choose? Q0 itself. You can choose this Q0 as a redundant. Then, what to do? Any method? Yes? Consistent deformation is going to be a little tricky because to write the compatibility equation, you have to really understand behavior. And in such problems, that is not the best way. Yes? You can do it. But the easiest way, whenever you have problems with <coughs> cables or with springs, 
a good method is the energy method, the theorem of least work. Right? So you find out, write down an expression for the complementary strain energy in terms of Q, Q0. For a beam, can you write an expression for bending energy? Yes. We'll come to that in the next. Can you write for the cable? Can you write for the suspenders? For the suspenders, you have to now include the actual strain energy in the suspenders. So, the moment it becomes indeterminate, you have to bring in, you have to know values of the flexural rigidity of the beam. The the shifting girder, that's done. Next is the actual stiffness, which you need the actual rigidity of the vertical members. And each vertical element, suspender, has a different length. Ea by L you have to bring in. And if you want to be really accurate, you have to include the elastic stretch in the cable, which we've ignored because we are saying it's perfectly inextensible. Once you make that assumption, you can ignore, you can say that there are no strains because it's infinitely uh, inextensible and you can, but if you want to be accurate, you have to include that. Then you have to differentiate that expression of strain energy, complementary strain energy with respect to Q0 and equate it to zero. You're minimizing the energy and you'll get the answer. So it's possible to do it. Okay. In fact, that was an assignment question in my uh, quiz when I cover this topic. That's one step ahead. We'll stay with statically determinate system. We were discussing cable. We're coming to the end of cables. And to finish it, we will go back to what is normally taught in engineering mechanics. Remember, uh, conveniently, we assumed problems where the loads are distributed uniformly along the horizontal span. But we began with the fundamental derivation for the profile of a cable subject to distributed loads, which can vary with x, and this is the fundamental equation. h d squared y by dx squared is q of x. So now we'll look at other real load possibilities. One of the commonest load possibilities is when the load is uniformly distributed not along the horizontal span, but along the, along the curved span. What's a good example of such loading? Self-weight. You take a chain or a necklace and you hold it like that. There's only one loading, its own weight. And assuming that the cross, it's prismatic, you know, a cable is prismatic, then it has if you, it has the same weight per unit length along the curved span, right? Is it fair to assume it to be a parabola? Not really, because if you look at this, uh, for the same horizontal distance, more load will be concentrated here, where it is inclined, than here. In this region, it's fair to say it's uniformly distributed in the horizontal span. Here, more load is packed. Are you getting it? So things are slightly different. So for completeness, let's look at that also. Let's try to get an exact solution and see what happens. So this is a case where the cable is subject to self-weight or uniformly distributed loads along the curved span. So Q0 is in this direction. And the, if you take an element dx, then Q0 ds is Q of x dx, right? total and q of x is changing and so same cable profile with its self weight you have to go back to the fundamental equation we are not assuming any parabola or anything so what happens well if you take this equation you can you will get an expression for q of x which is q naught into square root of 1 plus it should be y dash squared 1 plus y dash squared. You can work it out. There you are. 
So, uh, if you do some substitutions, I'm, I'm not too much interested. I just want you to remember that we all know that the shape is a catenary. So, we're coming to that. If you make these substitutions and simplify the calculation, you will end up uh, with a cable profile which is given by a hyperbolic cosine. Okay? And if you apply the boundary conditions, you will get this equation for your cable profile. It's just important enough to know that the cable profile is not a parabola. It is this. In fact, if you take a simply supported beam and give this loading, then the shape of the bending moment diagram will be a catenary shape. This is, a, this is called a catenary. Catenary, I think, comes from Greek or Latin. Catena means chain. Okay. So, just know this. It's a little complicated because to solve this is tricky because you've got H here and you've got H here and it's not easy to solve. How do you solve this? So, let's take an example. This is our problem. It's curved along the curved span. We've got an expression for the cable profile and if you take the origin here, then we say that, and if the sag is h, when x is equal to plus or minus l by 2, y is equal to h. And so if you plug in that boundary condition here, you will get this equation. And you can get an expression for capital H. Now you've got capital H outside and you've got capital H inside. You can't get easily a solution with capital H. How do you solve these equations? These are classical transcendental equations. Yes? Simplest way? Bisection method, but for lesser models, uh, you do the bisection method, uh, you do uh, trial and error. Shall, shall we do trial and error? It's easy to do. So you have to guess. And by the way, the cable length, you know, will be this half. You have to integrate it. And uh, this can be integrated, but you will get another sin h in the formulation. Okay, so you can do this only for numerical problems. So let's see. So if you plug in all this, these are the equations, catenary profile, capital H is given by this, and the cable length is given. This in summary is all that you need to know. In fact, remember yesterday I asked you a question of, uh, what is that? Amazon asked a question. Uh, I later realized that this problem has been solved in the internet. And one poor fellow went and Googled and got all these equations and actually slogged and tried to solve it. And he found that he could not solve it. And then he was wondering why no solution is coming. Then only he got the answer. So you can look it up. So that those things can also happen. Okay. So let's... Let's do a uh, solution for a problem like this. A cable is suspended between two level supports along a horizontal span of 75 meters. If the cable carries a dead load of 5 kN per meter along the length of the cable, and if the central sag is limited to one-tenth of the span, determine the horizontal tension, the maximum cable tension, and the total length of the cable. Okay, it's a very interesting problem. So how do you solve this? Well, first, let's do what is easy. Let's assume it's parabolic. You're not going to make a big error. We'll actually find out how much error you make. Parabolic means we know everything. <coughs> Remember? H is so easy to calculate. Q0 L squared by 8H, you plug in the values, you got something. N max is always at the support. You know the vertical reaction is Q0 L by, L by 2. And you got H, so the resultant of that, you've got it. See, at this stage, uh, we should master the concepts. Doing the calculations is for the uh, is easy. Anybody can do it. So we've reached that stage. We are just looking at the concept. In one shot, you can tell how to solve it. And we have an expression for the total curved length plug in. So we've got solutions based on the good work we've done till now. But let's want, let's do this exactly. For the exact solution, you know this equation is not correct. 
and you know the correct equation. This is the correct equation. Hmm? And unfortunately, it's not easy to solve, so let's try it. So let's use the boundary conditions. We know that half the horizontal span is so much, and h is this. So uh, h, 7.5 meter, if you plug in here, will be this. Q0, we already know. But h by Q0 is coming here, so we have to solve for h by Q0 numerically. Actually, we can take this solution for h and h by Q0 and try to crack it. That's a starting solution. Okay, so this is what we need to solve. So, uh, starting with the approximate value, we'll take h by Q0 given by this equation. Remember? So we begin with this. And remember, h by q0 has some units. Always as an engineer, be sensitive to units. The units of h is, capital H is? Kilonewton. And what's q0? Kilonewton per meter. So h by q0 is? Meters. And it makes sense because this is non-dimensional because it doesn't have any value. This is meters. So h by q0 must be meters. Always think like that. So your your feet are on the ground, you don't make blunders. So it's sensible to take this as a starting value. Then you'll find that this term is what you need, sorry, this term. So let's call that A. And then you calculate uh, this as a function h by q0. And you see, uh, this can be written. So this equation we are trying to solve. You can solve it by bisection method, but you can solve it. So we'll plug in the value of h by q0 here, plug it in, and we should get 0 for an exact solution. But unfortunately, we got something plus. So then we say, let's change this value. We increase 93.75 to 94. Plug it in. And instead of 0, you're getting plus 0 0.08, which is good for a practicing engineer. Even this is good, but this is more, even better. Take one more step. What will you guess? Tell me. It's your guess. You made many guesses yesterday, remember? 70 meters, 60 meters, 65 meters. Luckily, you didn't say 65.325 meters. Now, tell me, what's the next guess? Huh? 94.1, okay, I, I jumped 94.2, even that's not good enough. So, 94.5 is still high. 95. 95, that's it. 95, you, I mean, you made it. Now don't waste your time. 95. But if you chose a parabola, uh, you would have got 93.75. Okay. That's it. So this is an exact solution. So you can find capital H as this 95 by 5, n max is this, and s, you know the equation. So this is how you do it. But a lot of work was involved in getting that equation. Basically, h by q0 is a key thing. Just to demonstrate. So that tomorrow if someone says, can you do it the exact way? I, say, I can do it the exact way. But I don't want to waste my time. And let me see the error. After doing so much of hard work, I must get some return on my investment. Good engineers are always lazy. They don't waste their time. Academic engineers have all the time in the world because they are not interested in actually constructing anything, only in publishing papers. Okay, so here. Now what do you do? We notice that the approximate solution is fairly accurate. The error is less than 1.5% if you compare the earlier solution. Hence, for all practical, one and a half percent is, why is for an engineer, one and a half percent, civil engineer, one and a half percent is totally acceptable. Why? Because you know about the uncertainties. You know that the span itself, when it's actually constructed, you'll never get 75.00 meters. Hopefully, it won't be as bad as 74 meters, but 74.9, 75.1 is not uncommon. Then, that self-weight, 5 kilonewton per meter, who gave you that number? 
So there are lots of uncertainties. So when you're making massive errors to the order of 5% there, this much accuracy is all fictitious. You don't really get that accuracy. And so that's why now from now on you know parabola is good enough. Right? Good. So I'll ask you a tricky question which I want you to do. Because this will test your understanding. Determine the maximum possible span for a cable supported at its two ends on level supports if the central sag is limited to 10% of the span and if the permissible tensile stress is 150 megapascals and you are given the unit weight of steel as 78.5 kilo. So think. It's a tricky problem. Not straightforward. Here, normally you're given the span. Here, the span is not given. Unit weight of steel is given. Diameter of the cable is not given. What is given? You find whatever you want. The question is, just give me what is the maximum span. Only thing given is the allowable tensile stress. Don't exceed this. So, where is the maximum tensile stress going to come? That's a support. That support stress should be limited to 150 megapascals. Now, obviously, the, whoever made this question knows that some things get cancelled out. What gets cancelled out? That area which you want to find. Stress itself is force divided by cross-sectional area. So A you can say, let's assume it's A and that's it. And you can be sure that A will get knocked off somewhere. So you will never get the area. I want only L. Do it. At least show me a way to do it. Just the span I want. Horizontal span. Small h is given. What is small h? Point one. Point 0.1 capital L. There you are. What is Q naught? You figure out, you figure out. Okay, so although the actual cable profile is catenary, for convenience and without much error, we may assume parabola. Okay. So we'll make our life easy by assuming it to be parabolic. Okay, let's go do it together. The total weight of the cable, because you don't lose on the total weight of the cable. What is the total weight of the cable? Okay, gamma A S where S is the total length. So you know the total length because H by L is given. So total length can be written as 1.026 L. That's all there is. You know, you take a thread and hold it like that. And the curved length is only 2.6% more than the horizontal straight length if the sag is limited to 10%. Can you make the sag zero ever? What is the tension needed to make the sag zero? You tell me. You've done chain surveying, you've held the chain, or tape, you want to measure horizontal distance. Your friend is holding the tape at the other end, you're holding the tape. Is the tape ever horizontal? No. Can you make it horizontal? Why? Temperature, no, don't blame temperature. <laughs> Huh? It will tend to sag. How do you prevent the sag? By tightening, pulling. So why don't you pull? You're a strong fellow. The other fellow is also strong. Why don't you make it straight? Can you make it straight? Why? Don't give up so easily. Why can't you make it straight? It's only a tape. You should say yes. Can, any, can you make it straight? Are you thinking like a practicing engineer or an academic? <laughs> practicing engineer says, yes, I'll make it straight. 
Then academic fellow says, no, but we learnt that the horizontal force you have to apply is infinite. Says that's all theory, bakwas. Why? You measure the deflection and tell me. Because the tape is so light. So, yes, I can't make the deflection, the sag, 0.000. Are yaar, if it's 0.1, I'm happy. Can you make it 0.1? That's being practical. And what's the error you're making? Nothing. So, always be practical. But if it's a heavy cable, no, it's not going to be easy. Are you getting the whole point? So be practical. Infinite means a large value. Do you follow? So if, uh, so you have to be practical and have numbers, not concepts. If you have only concepts, you are an academic, not fit to do anything in practice. If you have numbers, you are practical. If you have both, you know when to be academic and when to be. Sometimes when you are in a, a dispute, it's always good to be academic. When the other person, the poor engineer has no defense against your powerful arguments. And if you show partial differential equation, just show the formula for catenary, he'll faint. <laughs> Because the, those weapons don't unnecessarily use the weapons when the weapon need not be used, should not be used, right? Don't get fooled. There's a semblance of sophistication, but it's a imagined sophistication. There's no real common sense is what you need. See, with all that sophistication, you could not answer yesterday's question uh, of uh, you know the solution being so straightforward. Okay. So, you can write Q in terms of A and L. Agreed, A is unknown, you correctly point out. L is also unknown. But we are guessing that somehow that A will get knocked off. It's a good guess. This is the total weight. A is in meter squared, L is in meters. Now, H is QL by 8H. How do we say that? Instead of saying W Q not L squared, we are saying Capital QL, like w, capital WL, right? That's the right thing. So you're saying this and you're getting H as 1.25 Q. Look at the units. Q is in kilonewton. H is also in kilonewton. So it's all consistent. And N max you can get. Maximum tension is at the two ends, which is the, the vertical force is half the weight, Q by 2. I think maybe if we write W, people will be more comfortable. Doesn't matter. Q by 2 is the vertical reaction and horizontal reaction is H, substitute, you get this. Now, this Q you, is where you substitute this quantity 80.593. Here, you've got an expression for the maximum tension in the cable when you have 10% sag. Now, what to do? Find out the maximum tensile stress you can get, which is this divided by area, and that is limited to this. So, if this is equal to this, then L is limited to 1.382 kilometers. That's how long you get. Good question. That's it. All you need is clear understanding, and you can do it. Now, if you change the the question and you say L by H is going to be even smaller. Let's say you want to make it L by H equal to 100. Then also you can solve the problem. You can't make uh, L by H equal to infinity. But L by H equal to 100. Then you see how many... Will you get a larger answer? Will you be able to get more kilometers? At least you should answer that. Obviously you will. How much will be that answer? You can try to solve this. When the sag is less, what will be the answer? Actually what will happen is, um, your 
n max will tend to h the you understand that's what will happen okay now we'll conclude by uh, asking the key question we made some assumptions one was the other one assumption was the cable is inextensible but actually the, nothing is inextensible so if it extends why will it extend why will the length of the cable be more than what it was before you applied the load? We are applying tension. Subjective to tension. Subjective. So? Language. Say clothesline example. You bought a new clothesline and you tied it across two hooks and you could play with like a guitar. Twang! You can hear the sound. Very tight. What is the deflection in the middle? Is it zero? Little academic engineer should also be there. <laughs> Nearly zero, you should say. Don't say it is zero. How can it be zero? Yeah, self weight will be there. You need infinite force to make it zero, right? It will be nearly zero. Maybe 0 0.01, depending on how long your clothesline is. Now you got us. If your clothesline is 1.3 kilometers long, it won't be zero, right? Okay, so you know that. Now you hang something in the middle. A hanger, you see your jeans, you hung bang in the middle. What will be the deflection there, the sag? It will go down, it won't be zero. How much? You can work out. Let's say your original length of cable was say 6 meters. Now what will be the change length of the cable? Will there be a change length? Or will it remain 6 meters? This is interesting. You buy a gold chain for your wife. All you have to do is to hang some weights on it. <laughs> and you say, look, your gold is increasing every day. Does it make sense? Something is wrong, no? <laughs> so will the chain become longer? To answer correctly. What will happen in the gold chain example, you tell? Break? No, 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 you're an engineer. <laughs> Maximum tensile stress you don't exceed. It, it seems foolish, but you took all your savings and you bought a gold chain for your wife. Don't say kilometer. How many, <laughs> how many meters? Will it be less than a meter? Okay, how much can you afford? <laughs> One foot. <laughs> One foot is quite a bit. 300 millimeters. Then you got a bright idea. <laughs> I said she would like it, she wants it 600 mm. <laughs> so every day you hang a weight in the middle. <laughs> then you remember this class, elastic stretch. So let's say you're able to increase it slightly. Are you really increasing the quantum of gold in that chain. Why? How is the chain valued if you want to sell it? By the weight. You go back, you hopefully get at least the same weight. Sometimes the weight reduces because of all your experiment. <laughs> but it remains the same, right? So how will the weight remain the same and the length increase? What's the magic? Let him answer. Yeah. yeah. What will happen? Length will increase slightly, but what's the cost? Volume is the same, otherwise weight won't uh, <coughs> remain same. What will happen? Some extension. Extension is there. 300 mm, you got 310 mm with great effort. But the weight is the same. What does it mean? Cross-section is, huh? Cross Cross -section is reduced. You bought a thick necklace, when you give it to your wife, it's a thread. <laughs> she won't like that also. <laughs> so you can't fool the ladies, they're very clever, they know everything. Weight also they know, length also they know, diameter also they know. <laughs> so be careful, don't play these games. Okay. Right. <clears throat> now, why will the length increase due to self-weight? 
tension is there. Actual tension is there. Actual tension is there. So uh, let's take this example of hanging in the middle, a closed line. Can you tell me the increase in length? How to find out? You tell me. I have a clothes line. I hang my jeans in the middle. It will increase in length. How much will it increase in length? Hmm? Tell me a method. Let's say you know the sag. Once you know the sag, you can find the actual tension. Um, what will be the actual? Let's say you got a, you got 120 degree angle. Let me 60, 60. Your weight is W. What will be the actual tension? Weight is W. What is the tension in the both sides? Hey, you should use brain, no calculation. Huh? This is W. How much will these be? If the, it's a, you know, 120, 120, 120. You tell me. It will be also W. Triangle of forces. How can it be W by 2? I said W only. W. Good. W. Got it? Then with that W, how will you get the new increased length? If it's actually stiff, it'll the length will remain the same. It has to come inside. Yes? How will you get it? E A by L. That's all. That will be the change. So you have to how will you get? You got W as a force. So WL by EA will be the slight change in length on one side into two. So that's the incremental change. Now you can work out how much to increase your jewel. <laughs> that's all you'll get. Agreed? Supposing you drape a sari there or the self-weight is there or a uniformly distributed load is acting then the calculation becomes a little more tricky because it's a curved shape. So then you'll find the actual force is changing from point to point to point. Then you have to integrate over half the length, right? But there will be some elastic stretch. Now, <clears throat> what's the difference between accounting for elastic stretch and ignoring elastic stretch? What is the difference between accounting for elastic stretch and ignoring elastic stretch? We are doing cable analysis. We are finding maximum cable tension, sag, length of cable, all that. If you ignore actual tension, will if you ignore elastic stretch, will your calculated cable, the horizontal reaction, be more or less? Less. less Why? Less. H will increase. What will increase? Yeah. Which edge? Small, small H will increase. If small H increases, then you know that capital H is the bending moment in the middle. You know, simply support. So that's the logic. One more thing I want to add. We'll we'll show the calculations shortly. That uh, in realities. If you're using steel, some other phenomenon also creeps in. Let's say you washed those jeans and hung them, and then there was an emergency phone call, and you flew to New York hmm, to get a new job. After the job is over, one year later you come back. And you open your room, what do you see? What will happen? I mean, you've done all your calculations correct and all. You've got S-grade instructional analysis. But what will you say? Will you get the same sack or something? It's called creep? What will happen? Relaxation. You'll have relaxation. The tension will get relaxed. That's why... All artists who play guitars and things like that, they have to keep tuning the string because string gets relaxed. Even your clothesline. Remember the first day you bought it, you could play twang with it. 
after one month you can't do that. Then you have to tighten it again, then only, right? So that's a separate phenomenon, we are not looking at that. But we are now looking at how to calculate elastic stretch. The increase in length delta S E, E is for elastic stretch of the cable due to elastic stretch with the horizontal span L remains unchanged and will result in a marginal increase in the sag delta H. So you can write elastic stretch E as delta S E, there is a total change in the length and you can write a strain because the strain will keep changing from point to point because the tension, the stress is different. Epsilon is dE by dS in the curved length and <coughs> you can write this as n by ea. Remember? You said w, now we are saying n, n by ea, actual rigidity. So you've got an expression for strain and you can, if you integrate it from one end to the other end, you will get the actual increase in length, which is called elastic stretch. Very simple. At least conceptually you should understand. Now if you assume this to be parabolic, then you can plug in the value of n and then if you do some substitutions, you can get an expression for the change in length. This is by the way. And if the original length is this, then this is the increase in length. And if you assume L to be constant, then you get an expression for delta H. And this is the change in the sag. The sag will also increase very slightly. It's a function of how much is the change in the curved length. And if the sag is changing, the increase in sag delta H will in turn lead to a marginal decrease in the horizontal tension, as you correctly guessed and also in the cable tension, which is the resultant of the horizontal tension and the vertical. Vertical reaction won't change because the weight of the cable is not changing. So that also you can calculate. You can take a, a you know, derivative of it and you can substitute here. And so there are ways of doing this. You just want to know that uh, academically you have powerful instrument which the poor practicing engineer won't know. But you have the tools. If you want, you can find. You can actually take a problem and do this and see how much effect it makes. But qualitatively, you should know what's going on. The percentage change in the maximum cable tension is given by delta n max by n max and you can even get an expression for that. Next is someone talked of temperature. You only talked of temperature. What do you think will be the effect of change in temperature? Two, two possibilities are there. One, increase in temperature. So what happens if temperature increases? Daytime. Daytime versus nighttime. Imagine this necklace you gift to your wife in the... Which is a good time to gift the necklace. <laughs> Day or light? It's a good question. <laughs> Assuming that there are huge differences between day and night, when is a good time to gift to your wife? Day. Daytime. Why? <laughs> it looks longer. It looks longer. All right. Night. If it's cold, it'll shrink. So it's not a good time to gift. So remember all this when you do your gift. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you know it will increase. Then what will happen? Same thing will happen. If there is an increase in temperature, there will be a corresponding increase in the cable length and thereby an increase in the sag because these two ends you are fixing. So that is not changing. And a consequent marginal reduction in the cable tension. These effects will get reversed and the cable tension will increase marginally when there is a fall in temperature. So you can now, earlier we wrote this in terms of the elastic rigidity. Now you write it in terms of L alpha T. Remember, in terms of L, you'll say S because it's the curved length. S alpha delta T. Delta T is the change in temperature. So you can pull out delta S T. You can expand it because the expression for S is known. And this can be written like that. And if this is S, and if you remain 
assume L to be constant, you can take the derivative of it and you can write this. This little work is involved. Okay, so that same story. And if delta H increases, capital H will decrease. If delta H reduces, capital H will increase. In the previous slide, we showed how that came in. Last thing is, sometimes your supports can slip. Give me a practical example of support slipping. Settlement. Settlement. Are this is a cable. You are saying the weight is so much that the... No, settlement is not. Practical example. Every... Uh, when the right brain works, it always thinks of what is actually happening in practice. You tell me yaar, your clothesline example. Have you ever put a clothesline in the hostel? Okay. Give me where the support can slip. Let's say, in the problem that I gave you in yesterday's class, you are, you don't have walls. You don't want to hang clothes in your own room because the space is small. You do it in the open. It will drive faster also, no? So you've got one pole. And you've got another pole. Or a branch of a tree. That's even more common. So you tie on one side and you stretch and tie on the other side. What will happen? If you tighten too much, the pole will move like that. The branch will move like that. Yes or no? That is called support slip. And if you hang heavy clothes, it will move some more. Yes or no? So if it moves, what are the implications? Is the question clear? What happens to capital H? It will decrease. What's the what's worst case scenario? How much can it decrease to? What is the lowest value capital H can take? Zero. When? When? When it's almost like a simple support. It's not a hinge support. It's like one side is a roller. Then zing, it can't take. Without horizontal tension, the cable cannot resist loads. Got it? So you got the general picture. Don't you think you should uh, think of practical situation? Or you're just happy to write the exam, uh, support slip. I don't know what support slip is. If there is support slip by some miracle. It'll... No, no. It's very common, very practical. Okay. So we are putting minus because... L is going to reduce, so we put minus delta L. The decrease in the span of the cable on account of support slip will cause a marginal increase in the sag, resulting in a corresponding decrease in the cable tension. So capital so H is can be written like this, and assuming S to remain constant and differentiating on both sides. So there are ways of doing this. So in terms of delta L, you can write delta H. This just to complete, you have these notes. If ever you need them, you can apply them. We're not going to solve any problem, but we generally know that this is this is a kind of second order calculation, which accounts for three things. One, the fact that actually cables are not infinitely stiff. There is something called elastic stretch. Two, temperatures can affect the sag and the tension in the cable. Three, uh, supports can also slip. Okay. That's it. We finished cables. Now we have one more topic in, in this chapter on funicular systems. Cables and arches. We'll now look at arches. Now, we look at two types of arches. Funicular arch and non-funicular arch. What is the difference between a funicular arch and a non-funicular arch? Correct answer. The bending moment will be zero in a funicular arch for some loading at every location. Very good. Non-funicular arch, it won't be zero. Okay. Why we don't say non-funicular cable? We say only, we can talk of non-funicular arch, but we can't talk of non-funicular cable. Why? Hmm? Sorry? 
Yeah. yeah. The funicle itself means string. The cable is assumed to be fully flexible, so there's no way it can resist any bending. It can resist only actual tension. So if it has to work, you have to somehow eliminate all bending. So if you apply gravity loads, there will be sagging moment that has to be eliminated by a hogging moment. And that hogging moment comes from the horizontal tension and the level difference between the support and, and the location in the cable, right? So a cable is always funicular because a cable is like a chameleon. It will keep changing its shape depending on the load. If you put a concentrated load, straight lines. If you put a UDL, curved, etc. Arch is not like that. Arch is made of a rigid material, say concrete or masonry. And you can make only one shape and you can't keep changing the shape. So you make one shape and ideally it should be a shape for the predominant loading. Let's say the predominant loading in an arch is self-weight. Like in a vault, you know in the olden days, I'll show you a picture of vault. Let's say you are an old primitive man and you, you have to build a, a house and you, whatever material you get, you use to build it. Could be mud. What is the ideal shape you'll build? Let's say something happens and we are hit by a meteor and everybody dies, you're the only guy alive. And we've gone back to the stone ages and you have other people, primitive people and you, you are the builder. With this knowledge, what is the shape you'll build your hut with? Ideal shape, you have to tell. You don't tell them, they won't even understand. They're all tribal people. But you can build. What shape? You know enough. Your memory has not gone. Memory is intact and today's class is fresh. Tonight only is going to happen. Okay. <laughs> what will be the shape, ideal shape? Hmm? Catenary. Catenary, you're right. Just like you have a catenary cable, you make a catenary arch. Got it? So those are, if you don't know the formula, at least parabola you won't forget. So you make it parabolic. So these are common sense ideas in which you need to use. So, but that hut will have to take concentrated loads, some coconut will fall on it, then it's concentrated load, or some monkeys, in, if you're doing it in IIT, you have to design for monkey load. Then you can have lateral loads also, wind will act on it. So it is non-funicular for other loads, but it must stand. Is it clear? Okay, with that knowledge, we'll move ahead. So remember we did this slide and we said that if you can get any shape of a frame, either an arch shape or a cable shape, and you guarantee that these two supports are hinged so that you generate a horizontal reaction, then if the shape resembles a bending moment diagram, then that shape is funicular. It could be downward like this or upward like this, it doesn't matter because we said that the free bending moment diagram in a simply supported condition, M0 of x is getting neutralized or reduced by capital H into Y of x. If it's funicular, this is exactly equal. And so the funicular shape is always one which imitates the bending moment diagram. We, we know this inside out. With this knowledge, let's talk of ideal arches. Let's say you have, you know you have a heavy concentrated load acting here and these are your support locations. And you had the freedom to choose the right arch, the ideal arch. You must always choose a shape which imitates the bending free bending moment diagram. So this will be the ideal arch. And you can easily work out. So even though this is a rigid joint, you can treat it like a hinge joint because 
actually every location here is going to act like an internal hinge in a funicular situation. Is it clear? Because no bending moment. So this is guaranteed. If you have two equal loads, PP acting here, then this would be the ideal shape and so on. So there's nothing to learn in funicular arches. So these are called linear arches. Okay. If you have, let's say you're building a bridge and there's a water body here and you want your vehicles to pass over it. Instead of a suspension bridge, I can do this. I can have a deck on top and put these, I won't call these suspenders, I will call them struts and they will transmit the load to the bridge here. Right? If they are very closely spaced, maybe I can assume it's uniformly distributed, in which case the ideal shape of this is parabolic. Okay, it's called a parabolic. This is the vault that I talked about, barrel vault, which you better plan. Huh? Tonight, it might happen and you might have to build it, so better know what formula to use. You have a rise, this is called the rise of the vault and this is called the span of the vault. Here, you can treat it as an arch because it's only a small extension. 3D, it's called a vault. If you have a dome, then it's a different, it's a series of arches. And the ideal shape would be a catenary arch if it's only self-weight. I'll just show you some pictures of some work I did many years ago. Uh, <coughs> uh, using coconut shells, just uh, memories of old come, past come. So when I, I was working in Delhi doing all hi-fi stuff, and then when I went to Calicut, I said we have to do something uh, using local materials. And uh, the coconut shell is the most neglected common material available in places like Kerala. Later these houses were built in Orissa also by some students. So, if you take a coconut shell, you'll be surprised how much load it can take. You test it in the lab, how much load do you think it can take? Well, we tested lots of these shells. They are freely available, all broken shells. Well, half a shell, it can take up to 500 kilograms, quite a load. So, but how do you use it structurally? So, we had two solutions. One was, we ideally want a catenary shape for a vault, but how, how do you use it? Well, we said you can string one on the other, closely fit. How do you do that? You drill a small hole, there's an eye in the in, so it's easy to drill. And you take a small wire, one less than one mm uh, cable through, and tighten it. And so, this is actually done. This is a removable formwork. If you want to build a thousand houses like this, no problem. This can be academically designed to have a perfect catenary shape. Okay. Which guarantees it will be in pure compression. You have a simple ordinary footing on this side and uh, you run uh, a, an 8 mm bar on top there. You can embed it in concrete later and you know you make these strands and take them through and connect it and you can string these these are strung on the ground all our students did that and uh, you've got this coconut shaped house and then what do you do uh, you to make sure you get integrity sideways we put bamboo strips Mm, so that all the sh shells are connected in the longitudinal direction. You put plaster, minimum plaster, and once the plaster is set, it will stand. Why? Because it's in pure compression. And then you, there are joints here, you unbolt this and remove this and take them away. And uh, then you plaster from inside. Inside plastering is a little more tricky, especially the top portion will tend to fall off. But you can do it. And you get a lovely house like this. This is a house constructed in uh, the campus of REC Calicut, now NIT Calicut. And uh, we built many of these. We, in, uh, we built schools like this in, in a few places. 
it won some awards. Just to tell, and by the way, these walls, they're made, they're called, they are also made of coconut blocks. You have a small uh, mold, put three shelves, and put any matrix on top. Even mud will do, but you, a lean cement matrix you do, you cast it. And this was done near a river, so it was just put in the river, the stream, and hardened. And then uh, it, when it's dried, it can take load. So the, you can make walls out of this, front and back. And very simple, we took 12 feet high, 12 feet wide. You can make any number of houses like that. Huh? It is designed. It is designed to take all kinds of load, wind load, concentrated load, simple calculation, because you know the flexural strength that you can get. Just by the way. Hmm? So, uh, it's fun. It, and you can actually build up. And it's like sitting in an air-conditioned house, because it's trapped air. Very comfortable. Okay. So, you have um, this situation. Now, I want to ask you some simple questions. You know everything about parabolas, because cables you've already mastered. What happens if... Okay, let's take a three-hinged arch. In a three-hinged... Why did people go for three-hinged arch? Because they become statically determinate. This is simply supported. Is this an arch? I remember in an earlier class I drew this on the board and I said this is not a real arch. Why? Because there is no horizontal reaction possible here, so it will have bending moment and it is non-funicular. But if you make it hinged and you put another hinge on top, then this is three hinged and you can calculate. But do you really need this hinge? Can we get rid of this hinge? Yes, you can, because the shape is funicular. So you can get rid of this hinge. Whether you put the hinge or not, this will also work. This is not needed f for this loading. Okay, this will also be hinge, uh, funicular. And uh, do you need to make the bottom fixed? No. This shape is funicular for this loading, and so all you need is to get a horizontal reaction. Even if you make it fixed, you won't get any fixed end moment here. Because there's no bending moment anywhere. So I hope you understand these simple concepts. Now, you can easily calculate the reactions. By now, you, you're masters in this. Supposing I load only one half. Now, these are all fun questions. I load only one half. Is it funicular or not? It's not funicular. Agreed. But is it statically determinate or not? Can you at least tell me what the vertical reactions are? What's the word? What is this reaction? This W by 2, how much of it goes here, how much goes here? 1, 4, 3, that's your, your masters. Good. Very good. What about the horizontal reaction? I am saying that also you can, without doing any calculations in your brain, you can tell me the horizontal reaction. I will give you an argument. Yeah, with full loading, the horizontal reaction WL by 8H. So with half loading, it will be half that. Is it correct or not? How easily you say it's correct? How will it be correct? You agree or uh, you know, you have taken my course, you keep quiet. You tell me. It's not correct. It is correct. Now you prove it's correct. We apply the reverse half to ah, you, Did I do this in class once? Okay. So you'll be shocked. That's how simple the answer is. So to do that, let's know. So these vertical reactions, you know. Horizontal reactions is a question. So, uh, we look at that shortly. But now you look at this. What is the effect of the highs of rise of the arch? Supposing I make this rise half, what will happen? The vertical reactions remain the same. 
the horizontal increase is double. So it's always a, like in a cable, the more the sag, the less the horizontal tension. This is called horizontal thrust. The uh, less the rise, so if the rise is very small, you will have, you have a major problem in practice. What's the problem? Foundations. Foundations? It should be very high. Huh? You have what to do? How will you make the foundation? Oh, I mean, it's very difficult, no? Because the thrust is so much, you won't be able to do it. So, in practice, how will you make sure it works? What's a clever thing to do? Increase the height. <laughs> this is a defense requirement. Actually, it came. The defense requirement says, we want to hide it so that the enemy planes can't even see it and we'll put trees all over it so nobody sees it. What are they called? Even the Hitler, I have bunkers like that. So, this is a requirement of the client. It has to be shallow. What to do? Pile foundation. You need raker piles at that angle. No, no. Huh? Yeah, you just tie the two sides <laughs> with a fairly stiff cable element. The tie will take the tension. After it's going to... So those are practical things you can do. Okay, anyway, you got the idea. Compare this with this. The question you can get in an interview. I've discussed this in class with some of you. You keep quiet. Okay, remember? Others, this uh, will give a chance to the others. This will deflect like this, this will deflect like this. Got it? And the ones who remember the formula, this will be the formula here. Right? If you compare this deflection with this deflection, can I say that because, you know, the load is half here, this deflection at the mid-span will also be half that? Yes or no? How many people say no? I thought majority will say no. How many people say yes? Okay, at least can you guess. Will delta 1 be less than delta or by 2 or more than delta by 2? Now I'll tell you the the real answer. It's small deformation, elastic theory holds. Delta 1 is exactly delta by 2. Can you prove it? Such a simple question. Can you prove it? It can be proved. It's principle of superposition. How will you prove it? Tell me. So, he is saying, why don't we superpose why don't we superpose so this plus this will be equal to that right now will this deflection delta 2 be the same as delta 1 yes or no yes. on what basis you say that suddenly everybody has come alive how do you say delta 1 is equal to delta 2 Symmetric. huh Oh no, this is not symmetry. You must give me a convincing answer where everybody in the room says, ah, correct. How do you say it's the same thing? Seeing it from that. So, let's say we actually do an experiment. A paka experiment with a dial gauge and all that to measure the deflection. And we have this beam and we will load this half. For you, it is left half or right half? Right half. For me, it is left half. So, I will draw it like this. You will draw it like this. But we are both measuring the same deflection. Got it? This is called the principle of parity. It's not, it's not symmetry. It's not superposition. Now, you see, my God, delta 1 is equal to delta 2. Okay? Clear? In fact, I wanted to do this in the book, 
I wanted someone to make a picture of this. Uh, and uh, I still remember the student who offered to do it, but he couldn't draw it. I said, I'll put it. And I want two students sitting on either side, measuring the deflection, one boy and one girl. And I said, make it Indian, don't put all foreign pieces. Put a Sadarji boy on one side. <laughs> and you'll never forget it. Measuring the same deflection, one fellow draws it like this, the other person draws it like that. Got it? Okay. So, now you do superposition. This plus this equal to this, we all know that. So, exactly equal. <laughs> exactly half. First you thought, how can it be half? In your mind also you probably thought that this shape will look like this, how can it be half of this? So you are thinking of the maximum deflection here. I never asked you about maximum deflection. I asked you about the mid-span deflection. Okay, so any question? We'll stop here and continue in the next class. Any question? So, first of all, the class becomes interesting only with such questions. Secondly, you'll never forget this. And uh, you must always combine right brain with left brain. Intuition must be very sharp and clear, but you must be always able to explain it using logic. Then only everything falls in place. Okay, we'll stop here. Thank you.